Hi, I'm Ed Bacon, the rector of All Saints Church, Pasadena. Whoever you are and wherever you find yourself on the journey of faith, I hope that you'll find something here that speaks to you. Welcome. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be aligned with your love, O God, our strength, our courage, and our freedom. Amen. I'm still in the throes, and I'm still in the throes of, and I'm still reflecting on the transformation that went on in this room during Healing Sunday two weeks ago. Over the course of all of our services, I don't remember a higher percentage of worshipers getting out of their pews, coming to the altar rail for the sacrament of the laying on of hands and prayers for healing. And I certainly don't remember such a high number of us wiping tears from our eyes during the healing or after returning to our pews. You see, I'm convinced that tears during worship signal that something at the level of the soul is being healed. A deep transformation is occurring, a transformation as mysterious as the transformation of the water into wine at the wedding in Cana of Galilee about which we just read. All of us long for the water of our everyday existence and the water of our woundedness to be turned into the finest wine of God's grace and justice. So I think I'll be living out of that transformation I observed and felt that Sunday two weeks ago for the rest of my life. One of the ideas that worshipers fed back to me from that Sunday as important to them, which relates to today, was the notion that we need to let go of, we need to throw away everything that is not us in order to be our true selves, to be made whole, to be healed. Joseph Campbell's version of that idea is you have to be willing to give up the life you've planned for yourself in order to live the life that's waiting for you. It's in that same frame of mind that I want to share my thoughts this morning with you about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and his birthday celebration today and tomorrow. The same days in which President Barack Obama was sworn in to his second term of office this morning at 9 o'clock our time and then ceremonially, ceremonially will be sworn in tomorrow again tomorrow morning. How fitting that our first African-American president is having his second inauguration on the birthday celebration of the leader who worked so effectively for racial equality. At his heart, I believe, Dr. King was a healer. All of his prophetic insight, his stunning courage, his political strategy, his social vision, his mental brilliance, and his rhetorical genius, all, I think, were in the service of healing this nation, and later in his life, healing the entire world of what he saw was moral decay. Moral decay so pernicious and disease-like that that moral decay had sufficient virulent power to bring this nation to an end. And so he wanted to do everything he could to heal the nation so that we Americans, we America, can be the instrument God has envisioned for us. Dr. King wanted us to give up the life we were living in order to live the life that is waiting for us to live to throw away everything that is not America in order to be made whole. In all of Dr. King's speeches and writings toward the end of his life, he spoke of three areas of moral decay, eating like a cancer at the body, soul, spirit, mind of our nation. Those three diseases are racism and other forms of prejudicial injustice, poverty, 
and violence and war. People who are attracted to worship at All Saints Church certainly do not have to be reminded of the existence of racism and other modern forms of isms, from discrimination against women to discrimination against members of the LGBT community to discrimination against people who live with handicapping conditions to people who are Muslim or other religions. We certainly see racism, blatant racism, at play in so much of the obstructionism against President Obama's policies. The contamination of racism in our politics today has brought us to an all-time low in the effectiveness of the governing bodies in Washington. Poverty. Dr. King believed that a genuine program on the part of the wealthy nations to make prosperity a reality for the poor nations was in the final analysis enlarging the prosperity of all people. One of the best proofs that reality hinges on moral foundations. And let me underscore, Dr. King, Archbishop Tutu, all the greats believe that our universe is a moral universe. He believed that one of the best proofs of the moral, the morality of the universe is the fact that when people and governments work devotedly for the good of the others, they achieve their own enrichment in the process. This is one of the most important things for you and me to know in our hearts. That from time immemorial, people have lived by the principle that self-preservation is the first law of life. Dr. King called that a delusion, a false assumption, a lie. He said, other preservation is the first law of life. It's the first law of life precisely because we cannot preserve self without being concerned about preserving other selves. The universe is put together by God in such a way that things go awry if we are not diligent in our cultivation of the other regarding dimension of life. I cannot reach fulfillment without thou. The self cannot be self without other selves. Self-concern without other concern is like a tributary that has no outward flow to the ocean. It's stopped, it's stagnant, still, stale, lacking life and freshness. Nothing would be more disastrous and out of harmony with our self-interest than for the developing for the developed nations to travel to a dead-end road of inordinate selfishness and not care for other countries, nations, tribes, communities. We are in the fortunate position of having our deepest sense of morality coalesce with our self-interest. But the real reason, Dr. King said, that we must use our resources to outlaw poverty, to abolish poverty, goes beyond material concerns to the quality of our mind and spirit. Deeply woven into the fiber of our religious tradition is the conviction that we are made in the image of God. The divine light is in every human being. And that every person is a soul of infinite metaphysical value. If we accept that as a profound moral fact, we cannot be content to see people hungry, to see people victimized with ill health, to see people undereducated, uneducated, when we have the means and plenty of means to help them. In the final analysis, the rich must not ignore the poor because both rich and poor are tied together. They entered the same mysterious gateway of human birth into the same adventure of mortal life. All of us are interdependent. 
Every nation is an heir of the vast treasury of ideas and labor to which both the living and the dead of all nations have contributed. And whether we realize it or not, each of us lives eternally in what Dr. King called in the red. We are everlasting debtors to known and unknown women and men. In the deepest sense of reality, all life is interrelated. The agony of the poor impoverishes the rich. The betterment of the poor enriches the rich. We are inevitably our brothers and sisters keepers because we are our brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Now a final word about war and other forms of violence. This undergirds this church's commitment to make sure that we have sane gun control regulations enacted in this country. And, and this point undergirds the fact, the reason why we will work to stop all war, including the war in Afghanistan, but also the use of drones in Pakistan and in other places throughout the world. <laughs> Dr. King said that we must find an alternative to war and human destruction. There is no excuse for the kind of blind craving for power and resources that have provoked the wars of previous generations. The question now is, do we have the morality and courage required to live together as brothers and sisters and not be afraid of one another? That takes morality and that takes courage and that takes commitment. President John F. Kennedy said, human beings must put an end to war or war will put an end to human beings. Wisdom, born of experience, should tell us that war is obsolete, Dr. King said. If we assume that life is worth living and that human beings have a right to survive, then we must find an alternative to war. Now please understand that for Dr. King, nonviolence was, as a friend corrected my spelling one time, not non-violence. He said it is non-violence, one word, because it's a way of life, not something you choose to do when you find yourself in a violent situation. True non-violence is more than the absence of violence or the counter of violence. It is the persistent and determined application of peaceable power to offenses against any human being and against the human community and in this case that means the world's human community. Part of the nonviolent way of life that Dr. King called for was a shift from a thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society. He called for what he defined as true compassion. True compassion, he said, is more than fleeing a coin to a beggar. It understands that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. A nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. Dr. King wanted us to give up the life of racism and prejudicial injustice. He wanted us to give up the life of perpetuating structures of poverty, hunger, and homelessness. And he wanted us to give up the life of violence and war in order to live the life that is waiting for us to live. He wanted us to throw away everything that is not America in order to be America and in order to be more whole. And for Dr. King, the one thing that could heal our nation, the one, the deepest thing that could turn our water into wine, is the power of love. I had a brief chance meeting with Dr. King one night, just for a second, at the baggage claim Carol in the Hartsfield Airport in Atlanta. 
I was a teenager. I shook his hand. I got his autograph. But at that point, I became a lifelong student of his. And he has taught me the centrality of nonviolence and love to healing and a joyful, playful, fun life. One of his favorite quotations, when Dr., which Dr. King used repeatedly, was that of Arnold Toynbee, which Jamie just read. He used it frequently in his speeches. Love is the ultimate force that makes for the saving choice of life and good against the damning choice of death and evil. Therefore, the first hope in our inventory must be the hope that love is going to have the last word. Friday afternoon and yesterday morning and early afternoon, I made a 24-hour trip to Seattle, Washington. I don't know if you've ever been to Seattle, Washington in the wintertime. <laughs> but the clouds were low and the temperatures were freezing and it was raining and I was cold. <laughs> There's some good, beautiful, sunny people who live in Seattle. But after 24 hours, I began to think that the whole universe was cold and rainy and damp and gray. It's what you called contaminated thinking and contaminated feeling. You begin to think that the particular present culture means everything. And I thought the whole universe was that way. And then, yesterday afternoon, we got on that plane and it lifted off, and within two minutes, we were above that blanket of dark gray cloud cover, and the sun was there, <laughs> bright, shining brightly. I said, that's the sun in Southern California. <laughs> but what it was, that was the sun of love. Because you and I can live in a culture of fear and prejudice, of poverty and violence, and we think that that is the reality of the universe? No, Dr. King said. Several years ago, I had an awakening about Dr. King. I went to a Dr. King celebration, and all of the speeches were about praising Dr. King. There was what? Not one speech about economic injustice, about nonviolence, about racism, and about the power of love. And at that point, I knew that Dr. King was crying the way Jesus cries when we spend more time praising them than following them. Praising them than following what they followed. Dr. King, Jesus. We're dedicated to nonviolence and love, which are the deepest motivators and instruments for enacting their visions of a healed nation and a world. If you and I this morning are going to follow Dr. King more than we praise him, we must learn what it means to live life based in love. That is what can heal. And that is what can turn water into wine. Amen. Amen.